Well, growing up, every Friday evening, my family attended the local football game at our high school. Only here's the thing. The reason we attended that game was not to cheer on the football team or the cheerleaders or even the school. No, the reason we showed up on Friday evening was to support the marching band. See, we were a band family growing up. My sister was in the color guard, which meant on Friday evening, the only thing that mattered to us was not the score or the officiating. What mattered to us the most was the halftime show. Because no matter how miserable the game was going, and believe me, we had a miserable football team. The halftime show was always the most exciting part. The band would take the field. The, the people would cheer from the stands. And for a brief moment, you forgot everything else that was going on. Halftime. Halftime was always different. Now, I mentioned that story because our scripture passage this morning comes at a very important moment in Jesus' ministry. According to the, the Gospel of Mark, the transfiguration of Jesus, it comes at the midpoint of Jesus' ministry, exactly halfway in between his baptism and his crucifixion. This is halftime for Jesus. And much like my high school football team, well, things were not going well for him. Oh, sure, Jesus had a few first-half highlights to celebrate. He had performed some miracles. He had called some disciples. He had given the crowd something to cheer about. But lest we forget, well, he also faced many setbacks as well. During the first half of Jesus' ministry, well, he had been kicked out of his hometown of Nazareth. He'd been called a blasphemer. He had been accused of being possessed by demons. Jesus' co-worker in ministry, John the Baptist, had been murdered, and people were coming for him next. Mark tells us that Jesus and his disciples, they were limping into halftime, licking their wounds, trying to make some kind of adjustments to get different results. After all, you can only experience so many losses before you just want to give up. I remember a woman saying to me once, David, you know, every time I wake up in the morning, I feel like I'm being poked with a thousand different knives. She said, it's not that there's one thing going wrong in my life. It's, it's that there are just a thousand little things that don't seem to be going well. I mean, there's the frustrations at work. There's the frustrations at home. There's the frustrations with the kids. In most days, I feel like I am failing at everything. Yes, I don't think any of us would have blamed the disciples if they didn't want to give up at this point. I don't think any of us would have faulted them if they didn't just want to throw in the towel and not come out for the second half. After all, isn't there a mercy rule? You can only take losing so much before you begin to lose hope. And yet Mark tells us, it's in this very moment of seeming defeat that Jesus takes his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to the top of a mountain. It's in this moment of halftime when Jesus gives them a show. Not only is not just a show he gives them, it's a transcendent religious experience. Fireworks are going off. The band is playing. Jesus' clothes were transfigured into dazzling white. His skin shone like the sun. Clouds surrounded them. A voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Yes, just in this moment when things couldn't get worse for the disciples, when everything was going wrong, well, that is the moment God shows up. God breaks through. And God gives them an experience of transfiguration. God comes to them in this moment of peace, this moment of hope. And God reminds these disciples that they are not alone. 
Yes, there on top of that mountain, Jesus is transfigured. And for the first time, the disciples know that no matter what they face in the second half, no matter what is going to come their way, they're going to be okay. I wanted to pray with a man before surgery once. And he said to me, David, you know, the strangest thing happened to me last night. He said, I was going to bed and I was worried about the surgery. I was anxious about how it would go. I was anxious about the recovery. My mind started racing, just thinking about what the next few weeks would be like. And the more I thought about it, the more worked up I got. And I started to worry that I wasn't going to go to sleep. But then this moment happened when this peace just washed over me. And I didn't ask for it and I can't explain it, but, but it was like I knew everything was going to be okay. And for the first time in weeks, he said, I could breathe. It's transfiguration. <laughs> those are those moments when God shows up in our life. And God gives us a glimpse of a greater glory. Now, transfiguration, it's what happens when, when God comes to us in the midst of our defeat, in the midst of our struggle, and God gives us a glimpse of something more. That we see the world not only as it is, but we see the world as it could be. A world where, where laughter replaces tears, a world where hope replaces despair, a world where faith replaces fear. No, you can't control these moments. The Spirit blows where it chooses. Don't forget, nine of the disciples did not have this experience on top of the mountain. Theirs would come later. But these moments, well, they give us just what we need to keep moving forward. They don't last forever, but they last long enough. Yes, there, in the middle of the gospel, in the middle of his story, Jesus is transfigured. For the first time in weeks, the disciples can breathe. I'll close with a story. About nine years ago now, right when I moved to Pinehurst, I was going through a, a very frustrating time in ministry. No, don't take it personally. It wasn't you. It was me. Oh, and maybe it was a little bit of you as well. I mean, there's plenty to go around. It's just moving to a new place is hard. It's frustrating. It's stressful. Learning a new congregation, meeting all these new people, trying to get it set up in a new community. I mean, after a while, you begin to second guess yourself. Asking questions like, does it matter? Why are you doing this? Why are you subjecting your family to this? I remember there was one Thursday night when I was working on a sermon that just wasn't coming together. I mean, I was writing as hard as I could. I was doing everything I knew to do to try to breathe some life into this message, but it was just dead. I was hammering away at it, but it was like operating on a corpse. And the more I worked, the more frustrated I got. Those questions began to creep in. Does this matter? Do you matter? Is there a point in any of this? <laughs> well, I was just about to give up, throw in the towel for the night when suddenly I saw I had an email. It was 1.31 in the morning. Uh, the email was from one of the kids that used to be in my youth group in Atlanta, back when I was a youth minister. N now, I had known this kid since he was 11 years old, and now he was in college. In fact, I had tried to reach out to him a, a few years prior, but, well, you know college kids. They're busy. And he never responded. Until that moment. This is what he said. He said, David, I just wanted to send you a message and catch up. 
but I saw you sent me a message and I never responded to it, so I truly apologize for that. I hope all is good for you and for your family. I've been listening to your podcast recently and they really got me thinking. I first wanted to thank you for beginning my relationship with God and trying to answer all of my ridiculous questions when I was young. It meant a lot to have you to look up to as such a great role model. You have been a huge influence on my life and I really wanted to thank you. My grandparents always ask if I have spoken with you because they think the world of you and Carolyn. And I also just watched our youth group video you made and I was thinking about all of the great experiences we had. And I will always cherish what you did for us. Without you, I don't know if I'd be as strong in my faith as I've become. It's been great getting to hear your message and I look forward to being able to follow along. I hope Carolyn and Addie are doing well and that Pinehurst is treating you all right. Much love, Vance. With that, I closed the computer. And I cried. Because it was like all of my frustration, all of my anger, all of my disappointment in that moment was transfigured. Oh, that moment, it didn't last forever. But it was enough. You know, life is hard. It's hard for everyone. There are disappointments, there are frustrations, and there are losses that we all experience. And anyone who tells you anything different, well, they're selling you something. Never forget, there are moments of grace as well. There are moments when God breaks through into your life and God gives you just what you need to keep moving forward. Yes, it is halftime in the gospel. It is halftime in your life. And the band has taken the field. <laughs>